So some fun facts. The blood flow in kidneys is higher than blood flow in the heart, liver, and brain. Kidneys measure around 4.5 inches in length. Kidneys are no bigger than a standard computer mouse or a cell phone. Each individual kidney weighs around 4 to 6 ounces. In case of a human born human baby, in case of <laughs> newborn human babies, the kidney to body weight ratio is three times the kidney to body weight ratio in adults. Um, <clears throat> what are the functions of the inner system? Uh, like we mentioned, every time I want you to know the function of each system it might show up on the practicum. Components, you have two kidneys, two ureters, a bladder, and a urethra. Kidneys have several functions. The number one function is to filter blood plasma and excrete waste, uh, regulate blood volume and blood pressure, regulate osmolarity, regulate electrolyte and acid base balance, secrete orthropoietin or red blood cell production, uh, EPO, helps synthesize vitamin D for calcium homeostasis. Um, so your skin will uh, synthesize vitamin D, your liver will synthesize vitamin D. So if those two systems fail, then your kidneys can synthesize vitamin D. Uh, also clears hormones and drugs, detoxifies uh, free radicals, and provide blood glucose during starvation. So like I always mention to you, you don't need to drink anything special to cleanse the liver. You don't, drink, uh, you don't need to drink anything to cleanse the kidneys. That's the job of the liver and the kidneys is to detoxify free radicals. So you don't need any special drink to do that. Now, excretion, extracting waste from body fluids and limiting them. Um, most of it is nitrogenous waste, uh, organic nitrogen containing molecules. Urea is the most common. Uh, azotemia is a condition developed when dysfunction of the kidneys may lead to uremia. So if you look at the organs of the inner system, uh, you have two organs, mostly two kidneys. The right one is lower because of the liver. You have two ureters. You have a urinary bladder, which is transitional epithelium, and then you have a urethra. Uh, shorter in females than males. Some fun facts. In case of adults, kidneys form only 0.5% of the entire body weight. Exactly half of one single kidney is capable of doing the job that is performed by two kidneys altogether. So if you were to donate one kidney, uh, the one remaining would hypertrophy, which means increase in size and be able to uh, do the job of two kidneys. Uh, each individual kidney consists of at least 1 million and up to 2 million nephrons. Nephrons are the functional unit of a kidney. Uh, nephrons are nothing but very tiny filters that are capable of filtering blood and eliminating the waste materials. Uh, where are they located? They're re located retroperitoneal uh, against the posterior abdominal wall at the level of vertebrae T12 to L3. Uh, and the right kidney is lower than the left. Uh, this is why I told you, you don't want to uh, uh, remove your ribs 11 and 12 because the ribs 11 and 12 help to protect the kidneys. Uh, there's three layers of connective tissue. So renal fascia, perirenal fat capsule, and the fibrous capsule. So if you look at this relationship, you can see where the kidney sits in relationship to the inferior vena cava, in relationship to the pancreas, in relationship to the kidneys, and then the colon. So everything is a, a tight fit everywhere, right in here, okay? So, and here's the lumbar muscles right in here. Remember I did you the, uh, the kidney percussion test? You can do a kidney percussion test, and if you get some pain, you might have a kidney infection or some kind of dysfunction here. Um, and the main job of the kidneys, again, is homeostatic imbalance, uh, upper parts, you know, both kidneys are protected by the thoracic cage. Uh, Perirenal fat provides cushioning. Lower parts of kidneys are susceptible to blunt trauma, especially the right kidney. Um, what can increase the susceptibility of injury? Well, falls, motor vehicle accidents, contact sports injuries. Uh, the renal artery is especially uh, vulnerable to injury for rapid deceleration during car crashes, leads to lacerations, uh, uh, torn or thrombosis, blood clots. Hematuria, um, that means blood in the urine, is an important sign of such trauma, so surgical treatment may be required. So if a patient comes in with blood in the urine, you don't assume uh, UTI, ask them if they had any kind of injury or uh, um, contact sports injuries or a motor vehicle accident or a fall, and you might want to check out the kidneys. All right, once a person reaches the age of 40, <clears throat> the number of functional nephrons present in each kidney start falling at a rate of 1% a year. But not to worry, 
Despite the decline in number of functional nephrons in kidneys after the age of 40, the kidneys continue to function normally because the nephrons have a tendency of enlarging once the demise begins. So if the nephrons in both kidneys are taken out and placed end-to-end -end horizontally, they will cover a distance of 16 kilometers. Again, if one kidney is taken away and the functional capacity of the other kidney is reduced to just 75%, it can still sustain life. This happens because the nephrons are capable of enlarging and handling the excess load, known as hypertrophy. Kidneys are responsible for maintaining a constant amount of fluid in the body. The entire flu blood in the body gets filled around 400 times in a day through the kidneys. So here's the... Gross anatomy of a kidney. Again, you have two of these. Here's the renal cortex. Here's the pyramid. Here's the minor calyx, major calyx, renal columns in between the pyramids, the renal sinus, the renal vein, okay, and the ureters. And we'll talk about how urine is uh, produced in the next few slides. When dehydration sets in, kidneys uh, stop producing enough urine until hydration is restored and blood volume increases. So a lot of people say, oh, you know what? Um, if I get uh, dehydrated, I'll just, uh, or I'm stranded out in the desert, I can just drink my own urine. But guess what? Your body won't produce urine because it's trying to preserve, conserve the water inside your body so you won't pee. Um, if the kidney, if the blood pressure in kidneys falls, they start sending out signals to the rest of the body. As a result of these signals, the blood vessels throughout the body become smaller to increase the pressure. This ensures that blood reaches every part of the body. If the oxygen content of blood falls, the kidneys can sense that as well. Once the kidneys sense a lack of oxygen, they create a hormone which triggers increased production of red blood cells. And that hormone is EPO. Um, so you remember Lance Armstrong during the Tour de France, he used to inject himself with artificial EPO. So the way that the body responds is they're saying, oh, he's injecting EPO. We need to make more red blood cells. And if you have more red blood cells, guess what? You can carry more oxygen. So that's how Lance Armstrong got an advantage in um, the Tour de France because he was injecting synthetic EPO. And so his body was able to carry more oxygen. So he fatigued less and therefore he was able to do the Tour de France in record time. Uh, again, your body naturally makes uh, uh, EPO, so kind of like uh, during the winter time, if you were to go snowboarding or skiing up at uh, Mammoth or Big Bear, you when you first get up there, you get out of breath, right? Because you're not used to the air is thinner, so there's less oxygen in the air. So your body is like, okay, what's going on here? So the first few runs, you get a little tired. Now, athletes will also live up in high altitudes before a big event because, and it takes about four to six weeks for this to occur, but your body will get used to the lack of oxygen or the decrease in oxygen and it will produce EPO and it will produce more red blood cells. So if you're producing more red blood cells, then you're gonna fatigue less. So, and that could be the difference between uh, gold, silver, and bronze for some athletes. Uh, as you know, I mean, Olympic athletes are uh, uh, phenomenal and they need every advantage they can get. So living, Living up in high altitudes is not uh, cheating. It's just a way that your body physiologically will respond to that. So kidneys pump around 400 gallons of recycled blood every day. Kidneys filter and return around 200 quarts of fluid into the bloodstream each day. Nearly two quarts are lost in the form of urine, while the remaining 198 quarts are recovered. So <clears throat> here's renal circulation, and this is very important for you to kind of understand. So the blood's gonna come to the aorta, and then once it reaches the aorta, it's going to go into the renal artery, which is right here. Once it goes in the renal artery, then it's just going to flow into the segmental artery. Then it's going to go into the interlobar artery. Then it's going to go to these little arcuate arteries right here. Then it goes to the cortical radiate artery. And then it goes to the afferent arterial. And I'll break this down a little bit more. But then the afferent arterial, which is a little bit larger than the efferent. So if you have a larger artery... That means the pressure is going to be a little bit more than if it's exiting, right? So then the pressure in the glomerulus will increase and that will push the blood plasma out of this filtrate and produce a urinary filtrate into the Bowman's capsule. And again, I'll show you this, how this occurs. And then the blood will return via the efferent 
arterial. There's this vasa vecta right here, paratubular capillaries, cortical radiate vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, renal vein, and then back to the inferior vena cava. And then it comes back again, gets filtered, goes back and forth, back and forth, 400 times a day, maybe more. Again, here's the blood vessels of the kidney, aorta, renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery, arcuate artery, cortical radial artery. Then the afferent arterial brings it to the glomerulus, which are a whole bunch of capillaries. Capillaries will squeeze this blood plasma out, so it'll squeeze out uh, urea, ammonia, hormones, uh, pharmaceutical drugs that you might have taken, uh, sodium, potassium, glucose. But like I mentioned to you, the, you can think of the kidneys as really stingy. They'll... Uh, when it goes through this little nephron, and we'll talk about this, it will try to uh, reabsorb uh, 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 most of it. So you're only going to excrete out what you really don't need. Uh, um, okay. Kidneys are connected to bladder with the help of two tubes, known as the ureters. It is the bladder where the urine is stored. Ur the urine that we excrete is stored anywhere between one to eight hours. Um, interesting fact is that we don't ur urinate until the bladder is half full. Uh, most people, their bladder size is about 500 mLs or 500 cc's, so you don't really need to go to the bathroom until you can get to about 250 cc's. Um, once the half of the bladder is full, signals are sent to the brain, which in turn tells it it's time to urinate. Another interesting fact about kidneys is that they are capable of activating vitamin D in your body. So this vitamin is usually produced by special skin cells when they're exposed to light. So if the skin fails, the den and the job passes to the liver, and the liver fails, then the job finally goes to the kidneys. So you have a lot of checks and balances for vitamin D production. Some children are born with only one kidney, but then the single kidney eventually grows to the extent where it's equal to combined weight of two kidneys. And if you were to donate your kidney, uh, you would be okay as well, because the other kidney that you have will grow in size hypertrophy. Remember, you really only need one kidney to the do the job, so you have uh, excess. All right, so breaking this down to the microcirculation, if you look at this, here's the arcuate artery. Then it goes to this cortical radiate artery. And then it branches off into this afferent arteriole. This afferent arteriole, if you look at it, it's a little bit larger than the efferent arteriole. So when you have more blood flowing in, higher volume, and it's going out, right, the pressure is going to build up in here because, imagine, just... A lot of pressure going in here, and if you have a little bit leaking out, the pressure is going to build in here. And that pressure building here is what squeezes out all those ions, squeezes out those hormones, squeezes out this urinary filtrate. So the real job of the glomerulus capillaries is to produce this urinary filtrate right here. And this urinary filtrate will have, like I mentioned, urea, ammonia, pharmaceutical drugs, hormones, sodium, calcium, uh, you name it. But your body's like, wait a second, wait a second. Just because you make this urinary filter doesn't mean that we have to get rid of it all. So the proximal convoluted tubule will say, okay, what else do we need? Do we still need some water? Do we need some of that sodium that you linked out? Do we need some of that glucose? It'll reabsorb it in these paratubular capillaries. Then it will go to the descending loop of Henle and ascending loop of Henle. So during this time, it'll say, okay, you know what? There's some sodium in here that I might pick up. There's still some water that I might pick up. Uh, so again, it'll, it's pretty stingy. You know, pick up uh, uh, electrolytes or anything that it needs back and put it back into circulation. Now, diuretics work at this ascending loop of Henle. And the way that the diuretics work will, is that they'll hold on to the sodium. And so the sodium won't leak out. And as you know, water is attracted to sodium. So what happens is if you have more sodium into this ascending loop of Henle, then the water will stay in here and then you'll pee it out. So that's how diuretics work. And there's different types of diuretics, but the loop diuretics uh, work at the ascending uh, loop of Henle and that's how they work. Okay. By the time it uh, comes out to the collecting duct, it's pretty much urine. But again, the... Uh, the kidneys are really stingy, and they'll pretty much try to get everything back before it really comes out as urine. Um, excessive antacids in milk can cause kidney stones, so be careful taking that. Uh, pancreas, uh, stimulated by sugar to produce insulin that keeps sugar levels at check. 
the sugar level and in body increases, uh, excess insulin is produced. This forces the body to excrete extra calcium through urine, which is yet another cause of kidney stones. So diabetics are sometimes uh, notorious for kidney stones uh, because their insulin and glucagon levels are out of whack. Uh, throughout the day, kidneys filter and produce around 1,000 to 2,000 milliliters of urine. So if you think about it, your, your bladder can hold about 250. The 250 uh, is 1,000. So you should be going to the bathroom about four to eight times a day. All right? uh, again, if you're pregnant, you're gonna go a little bit more. If you're not drinking enough fluid, you're gonna go less. But on average, you should go about four to eight times a day to the bathroom, okay? So in general, we excrete around 1.5 liters of urine on the average single day. Malfunctioning kidneys can lead to the development of anemia. Studies reveal that most anemic patients usually suffer from some, some kind of kidney disease. Kidney disease can never be reversed. Uh, its progression can only be slowed. High blood pressure and diabetes can both lead to failure of the kidneys. And when the kidney functions are completely lost, it's known as end-stage renal disease or end-stage renal disease or failure.